Korean Baptist Church online services. Um, I'm Aaron Mitchell, the assistant pastor. Um, I'll be bringing the Sunday school lesson this morning. Um, <clears throat> normally, in our normal makeup of a Sunday school, we would take prayer requests. Um, we would pray over those that need it. And we would take an offering for the missionaries that we support as a class. That being said, don't forget to send in your prayer requests online before the service if you can. Um, and then don't forget um, the missionary we support as a class, if at all possible, during this time, if you're able to um, continue support there as well. Just label it separately. This is above and beyond your tithes, offerings, and faith promise missions. This is, as a Sunday school class, we support um, a series of, of a few missionaries there in the Philippines. Um, <clears throat> that being said, this morning um, we'll begin our study. I want to I do a continuation of last Wednesday night's um, lesson on why Babel or Babylon and the beginning of where that starts. Um, I left off... Um, at a very awkward kind of place because I knew that if I continued, I would have probably gone another 30 minutes to 45 minutes and that would have put us hour and 40 minutes and I would have beat pastor in the record of preaching so far since we've been in the online era. <laughs> that being said, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 17, Revelation 17. Revelation chapter number 17. <clears throat> title of my lesson today is the seven heads of the Antichrist. Seven heads of the Antichrist. I've heard a lot of different things about this topic. Um, some make better sense than others. Um, some people, their opinion is not based upon what the Bible says. So we're gonna uncover this kind of like a crime scene and how you would uncover it if you were a detective. I think that's one of the best ways to look into uh, the Bible sometimes, um, to just try to do by process of elimination certain things that just don't fit. You don't wanna stick a round peg into a square hole. Why? Because it doesn't work. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of people out there trying to do exactly that. Today's lesson will be, I, I never really have control over it, hopefully a little less preachy and more uh, teachy. Um, so I'm going to try to break this down. I'm going to try to go slower than I normally would. Um, my, um, my ADD kicks in sometimes and you say, wait, I, I didn't know you had ADD. It's, it's called my anti-devil delivery and I can't stand Satan and what he's done to this world. And I'm, I get frustrated as I see the fear and the panic throughout all humanity at this time. So let's just see what the Bible has to say about the seven heads of the Antichrist, because there's a lot of talk about the end times right now. A lot of people are starting to dive into their Bibles. I'm hearing that many churches are starting to preach more on this topic than they had in the past. This is something that we went over as a Sunday school about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and then over the past last summer, we had dove into it just a little bit because of um, different things that had happened in the world. But in Revelation chapter number 17, the Bible reads in verse number seven, we're going to read verses seven through 13. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. 
And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is, is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask this morning that it would be your words and not mine, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to move. Lord, help me to stay focused. This is sometimes a confusing, confusing topic. And Lord, I just ask that you give me all clarity, that it would benefit your people. That's why we come together as a church to exhort each other and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would help each individual who's watching this, that it would benefit them. And Lord, that it would strengthen them as well, knowing that you knew the end from the beginning. Matter of fact, your word says declaring the end from the beginning. Nothing has ever taken you off guard and nothing ever will. And there's reassurance in that. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to try to go somewhat slower than I normally would. I tend to get a little excited, I guess, at times. And rightfully so, because the state of our nation is terrible. And I have grown up in this nation. I've supported this nation. Um, I love America. Um, it's the place of my birth. Um, and it'll probably end up being the place where I eventually die, if not raptured out of here. Um, and I want to fight to keep America as godly as we possibly can. Um, it's each one of our responsibilities to stand up to this system. On Wednesday night, I talked about the spirit of Babylon and the spirit of the Antichrist, which travels and transcends from the Tower of Babel until this very day. But we can fight that spirit. We can push that spirit back. The Lord, um, he's very, very patient with us as a people. And I just ask that each one of us try to do our part to push back the wicked agenda of the beast or Antichrist the beast, false prophet, and the system of government which has tried to destroy and take down humanity from the Tower of Babel on. <clears throat> so when I begin this morning, I want to talk about the seven heads briefly. We went over this on Wednesday night. The seven heads are seven mountains. The seven kings in verse number um, number nine the seven king or the seven heads on, on the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and they are seven kings. I want you to notice this talks about the seven past world empires or six world empires and the one that's getting ready to come on the scene. So this morning, I want to, I think it's best to go backwards in, in, in order to go forward. Um, we need to be really careful on how we interpret and dissect the Bible. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the Bible is truth. So these seven kingdoms ruled by seven kings, five have already fallen, according to John at this time. The first one was Egypt. The second one was Assyria. The third is Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. The fourth is the Medo-Persian Empire, and the fifth was Grecia, or Greece, and that was Alexander the Great. Most people probably know him and Nebuchadnezzar more than they know the other kings or rulers during these first five world empires. The sixth is, according to John, five are fallen and one is. At the time that the book of Revelation was penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to John the Revelator, um, <clears throat> at this time, Rome was the world empire. 
And they ruled the world with an iron fist. They had the strongest military. Um, they had huge paganism as a religion. Um, it was very wicked. And, and the temptation for many Christians and many people who go and study the Bible is to say, because Rome was so strong in this area, that it's the same thing that takes place in the book of Revelation as Babylon. But I want to go a little bit deeper than that, because I want to show you from God's word, I believe it's a, um, a mixing of all seven of the worst rulers to ever live or take place on this earth. See, the book of Revelation is the best way for us to study the Bible because revelation means revealing. This is Jesus revealing to the apostle John what's going to happen. And if we take the book of Revelation and go backwards, instead of taking the dark glass of the Old Testament to try to move forward, we'll get the correct interpretation of God's word. But we also need to remember that it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. And it's extremely important that we use the Holy Spirit of God to discern the Bible. Now, that being said, um, revelation means revealing. And the Apostle John, one of the things I found quite interesting, this is kind of a side note, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, these are three of the four Gospels. They all have a part on prophecy. But the Apostle John in the book of John does not have any prophecy in it at all. Very little. You may be able to pull a verse or two out. Why is that? because he actually pens the book of Revelation, which is the completed picture of what's to come. And there's a, probably a very good reason for that, because John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John, holding faithful and true, when all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled initially, the one disciple that came to the foot of the cross, regardless of what kind of torture he may face, looked on Jesus standing there with his mother, um, Jesus recognized him and said to him, take care of my mother, will you, John? See, John's the one disciple that came back regardless of the cost. And I believe his reward was to live, um, I, I wouldn't say he lived a, a great rest of his life because he was tortured many times for the Lord Jesus. But in the end, he lived to be the oldest out of all the disciples and I believe he died of natural causes, which is what the Bible alludes to. That being said, that being said, Revelation is our revealing going in to the Old Testament. So let's start in verse number one. Verse number one of Revelation 17 and verse number 15 of the same chapter explain a very important question. And this question is going to transcend back in to another passage in the Bible, in the book of Revelation as well. I want you to notice that the angel says, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. And if you paid attention to Wednesday night, the great whore is this mystery, wicked, false religion. Now, this false religion has put on many different faces throughout the history of time. But this false religion is an antichrist Babylonian spirit that has transcended all the generations prior to it. And I want you to notice the Bible says here there's going to be a judgment on that wicked religion. So don't, don't worry about how the Muslims are running around lopping people's heads off. The Hindus are burning Christians and torturing them to death. And the Catholics in the 1500s uh, murdered so many Christians, burned them at the stake. Don't worry about the world's false religions, brother and sister in Christ. Why? Because this whore, this Babylonian whore, has sat on many waters. And what the Bible says is it has sat across many time frames on many different people throughout history. And make no mistake, the devil has always, always tried to kill people through religion. You know, it's like this. If the devil can't get you off into all wickedness and sin, he's going to try to get you to believe that what he's telling you is true in regards to religion. That's one of the mysteries of Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. One of the mysteries of this world empire is that they're going to be able to draw people away in a very big and great deception. And make no mistake, the difference between this 
Babylon. And this religion is going to be that it transcends the entire globe. See, every other kingdom up until this point was is centralized in certain areas, whether it's the Egyptians that were in a smaller course of the world over in Egypt, and it transcended through into Canaan and different areas. Then the Assyrians come, the borders grow just a little bit more. And then the Babylonians come and the border grows a little more. And the, and the Medo-Persian empire comes. And as man expands the false religions and spirit of Babylon and the antichrist religion, and that spirit goes with it as men expand and worship themselves. We see a lot of that today. And here's what happens. By the time you hit the Roman empire, this is a very vast and large empire spanning all the way to the bottom of Germania, all the way, which would be considered Germany or North, Northern Europe. And it's all the way down through Egypt and pushing its way into Asia in that direction. And people are beginning to multiply. And at this time, um, historians and, and biblical scholars alike would say that there were about 200 million people on the earth at the time that Jesus came here. And what we see is we see a, a very small population compared to what we see today. Now, that being said, this B system is transcending many waters now, not just the seven seas, but it's transcending all nations, all people, and all tongues. But there's coming a one world ruler. There's coming a one world kingdom again. See, it was a small, and at that time, many of them probably didn't think that those empires were very small. They covered the world or the world of their day. But now that the world and people are scattered abroad and they're just branching out as men and women begin to multiply and have children and people are, are going all over the place and, and, I mean, being able to move to and fro with great ease, people's work has been able to open up to where many people work in many other countries where that was never really possible a hundred years ago. You know, if, if you waited back then on a ship, you could end up dying on there before you even reached your destination. But now we can see through technology, we can see through the invention of airplanes and ships and all these great things that can travel and transport us to and fro, that there's many waters, there's many nations now. I think there's somewhere between, depending on who gives the count, 197 to right around 214 sovereign nations. So now this religion, this false propaganda has transcended many waters or many nations or many tongues. It's also going to rule the world as we get into this. We'll see this. Verse number 15, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are people. See, people are falling for false religion left and right. I've never seen anything like it. Unfortunately, even in America, under the banner of so-called Christianity or a liberal Christianity, they're being deceived even today. And that's what causes spiritual fornication. When you go against God's word and you're not in the will of God, or you're relying on some false teaching for your salvation, you're just as guilty of blasphemy and falling for it as the Antichrist will be himself. And there are people in multitudes and nations and tongues. Tongues means languages. You know, that's been butchered throughout the entire book of first and second Corinthians. You know, I'm just going to grab this rabbit by the tail real quick. If you've read first and second Corinthians, do you realize Paul's rebuking them? Have you ever thought that at the end of second Corinthians, that Paul says, if I have to come again, if I got to come a third time, if I got to write another letter to you, I'm coming. <laughs> and I'm going to be the hardest preacher you ever saw. And even after you look at all the many gifts, speaking in different languages, doing all these different things, the most important thing at the end of the day is to love people so much that you're willing to give them the gospel. Look, I don't care about having a superpower. I've got a super God. I care more about getting people saved. I care more about 
getting them on the right track with their faith, then I'm worried about getting up there and, and, and looking creepy and dancing around and acting like I've been touched by some weird spirit. And make no mistake, that is a weird spirit that makes you jump around and look silly. I, I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> that rabbit is funny. Now, but I want you to notice this, that many waters is many nations, many peoples, many tongues. And that's really important because this whore is what ties together the false government system. See, when you go back in time and, and you see World War II and you see like a man, a man like Adolf Hitler stand up and rise to power, he was very top heavy in one area. And that was his propaganda. That was exalting the nation. That was getting everybody to rally. But see, he failed in trying to draw religion together. See, anybody who had the combination of a religion and a government does so much better controlling people. And Adolf Hitler was really poor in this one area. Joseph Stalin, the same thing. Why? Because communism's a religion, but it's a very weak religion. You can poke holes through it all day long. Mao Zedong, he came on the scene. And these men are just like an antichrist. They came in the spirit of an antichrist. But guess what? They weren't able to hold it all together. Now, in the end times, the reason why the revelator John in chapter number 17 is trying to pen this as he sees it is he wants you to notice something. He wants you to know that the final religion is not only going to be a beast of military might, a beast of propaganda like Hitler was, but it's going to be a religious beast. And, you know, we can always go back in time to see what the first six kingdoms did right. Now, they sit on many waters. Go, go in your Bible to Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. Verse number one's been butchered so many times. I, I've, I've never seen anything like it. But we're going to use the Bible to define the Bible this morning. Revelation 13, number one, verse number one. The Bible reads, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. See, I've heard that people say that the sea is the abyss. Well, listen, let me tell you something. The devil's not in hell yet, and the devil's not going to want to go to hell when he gets there. You know, there's another passage in Revelation chapter 20. We're not going to go there. But that's the only time the devil ends up in the bottomless pit before he ends up in the lake of fire. And let me tell you something right now. The devil wants to avoid hell more than you do. So keep that in mind. The sea is actually water, right? I mean, the last time I went to the ocean and I went and I saw it, it looked like a lot of water to me. Last time I was at the ocean was my son's marriage. And I'll tell you right now, there was an awful lot of water. And we're divided by many seas right now. And this beast has come out of the sea or out of the nations. He's come out of these areas in order to set up his last dominion. You know, false religion has sat upon the world all around the world today. It just sits there. It promotes an antichrist. And the word antichrist just means another or in the place of Christ. The false religion is going to teach you about a Jesus, but in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, beware, there's another Jesus being preached. And there's always another Jesus. And we have to be really careful how we interpret these things. You know, many of these guys have said that the sea is actually the bottomless pit or hell where in second Peter chapter two and Jude, I think it's verse number seven, six or seven, where it talks about the angels, which kept not their first estate, but were um, um, bound in change until the day of that great judgment. But let me tell you something. God isn't going to let the devil out unless he wants to. The devil's not going to go to hell a minute sooner than God wants him to. 
And God, when he puts Satan back, when he puts him in hell, I'm sorry, I almost said back in hell. When he puts him in hell in Revelation chapter 20, he allows them to come out one more time to tempt the nations that final time. And then he's gone for good. See, the devil doesn't have the keys to the car. See, the devil doesn't get to decide and go decide when he gets to come and when he gets to go. He doesn't get to borrow the keys from Jesus. He doesn't get to ask permission. Hey, I think I'm going to go down in hell for a little bit and see how my demons are doing. And then I'm going to come back up and I'm just going to go back and forth and do whatever I want. No, the devil is trying to avoid hell. He doesn't want to go there and he wants to send as many people as he can. Well, how do you know this, brother? How do you know that the sand of the sea where John stood and the beast rise up out of the sea, how do you know this is true? Because having seven heads and ten horns upon um, upon his horns, ten crowns, and having his heads, the name of blasphemy, you're seeing the world empires come out of many different nations, many different tongues, many different people groups. This false religion's coming up out of this area. It's coming up out of the waters, and it's going to rule over all the waters. Well, how do you know that? Let's go. Verse number two, and the beach was the beast of the beach. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. I'm going to stop right there because if you remember without flipping back, if you need to, that's okay. And in, in the book of Revelation chapter number 17, it talks about the beast that was and is not. And that's explaining this right here. See, there's no better way to start a false religion to copy Jesus Christ than for you to die yourself and come back from the dead. The only problem is the devil's very limited in what he's able to do. Now, that being said, there's many who would debate how this Antichrist comes back to life. And I personally believe in the first part of Daniel's 70th week, I believe the Antichrist is a human being. I believe he's the man of sin. I believe once he's dead, he becomes indwelt with the devil himself to go out to deceive the nations. Why? Because deceiving the nations is too big a job for a man or even one of his lesser demons. It's the most critical job in all of Bible history, him deceiving the nation. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't take long to be able to look back if we wanted to go back there and we see Judas Iscariot, another person indwelt by the devil himself, sending Jesus to the cross. See, Satan can't understand the prophets. He can't understand the word of God. He thought he was actually going to beat Jesus by putting him on that cross. But in putting Jesus on the cross, he set the captives free unwillingly. But see, Satan thought if he could indwell Judas Iscariot, the job's too big for Judas. He can't do it. I got to do it for him. Hey, and guess what? When the devil goes to do this in the end times, he's going to run into the same fate Judas Iscariot did. Now, this deadly wound was healed. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, what if it's just a wound and well, hey, you know what? Maybe maybe Jesus, when he died on the cross, uh, maybe that was fake. Maybe his hands, maybe because the Bible said in Zechariah, when he comes back and he stands before the nation of Israel and he says, he says unto them who he is. And they say, what are these wounds that are in their hands? And Jesus says, I got these in the house of my friends. Well, maybe Jesus didn't die then because they were just wounds. No, he was wounded unto death and he was healed. But it's a false healing that takes place. It's a deceptive healing that takes place. And because of this, all the world will wonder after the beast. When you think about it and you, and you think about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man looking up his eyes in hell, he looks over at Abraham and Lazarus and he pleads with them to send anybody back. And Abraham says, look, if we even set one back from the dead, they wouldn't believe. But you know what's funny about that in this time in history? The world will be ripe, ready to believe. Why? Because they're looking for a hero today. Hey, your hero's not Bill Gates. Your hero's not George Soros. Your hero is not a man. Your hero is God Almighty. That's 
your hero today. But unfortunately, this beast system, the seven heads of this antichrist is going to deceive many. Now, that being said, verse number four, and they worshiped the dragon. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to be God, right? That's what got him in trouble in the first place. I want to ascend up into heaven. I want to sit in the sides of the congregation of the north. I want to be like the most high. He wants to be God. And unfortunately, he's become the God of many people's lives today. Unfortunately, because that's not God's will for humanity. That's not God's will for you. That's not God's will for any of us. Because you know what? This guy, his intentions are not to save you. <clears throat> and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? See, I believe that he has to die. Because here's the thing, nobody's going to, with the way technology is and with all the iPhones and all the satellites roaming around, when somebody's killed, I mean, we can just look back to when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Now, I know there's a lot of theories on who did it and all this stuff, and that's all really interesting. But the truth of the matter is we all saw him die. And even with the technology back then, and as bad as the black and white footage is back then, or when they tried to introduce color to, to just show you a little bit more, here's the thing. He dies. He's killed. He's shot. And unfortunately, you see him go down and you see what happens to him. And you can see the other shots hit him after the first shot. And you can see that. Do you really think with technology the way it is today that there's going to be some, oh, I don't know, photoshopping of this guy getting killed. And then everybody's going to be like, eh, no, I think he's going to die. And I think he's going to die in such a way that it leaves no doubt. Why? Because nobody's going to fall for it. Why? There's already too many skeptics in the world today. People already question everything, which is good. You should question some things, but make sure you have some facts to back it up when you do. Who is like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? See, the thing is, he comes back from the dead. That's why you can't make war with them. How do you beat an unbeatable person? See, this is after Revelation chapter 11. This is after the two witnesses have been killed. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who can make war with this guy? He can kill anybody. He's already come back from the dead. See, he's got to have a very convincing lie. I've heard that the seven heads are kingdoms and this is a reemergence. The deadly wound to the head is the reemergence of the Holy Roman Empire. Look, Catholicism does not have the grip on the world the way it used to. Okay. And by the way, here's the other thing. They worship the dragon. Do you realize that the devil is so wicked that he doesn't want you to worship anything but him? And I believe that the religion that he sets up during this time exalts and honors him. 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 Why? Because he wants to be like the Most High. He wants to sit on the sides of the congregation of the North. He wants to be the one you worship, not Jesus Christ, not the Lamb, not God the Father, not God the Holy Spirit. He wants your worship. And too many people have been deceived today. Too many people. Verse number five, and there was given unto him, speaking of this Antichrist, this beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. There's, there's a really neat Psalm, Psalm 74. I'm not going to turn there, but when you look at the amount of times that blasphemies and blasphemous speakings mentioned in that Psalm, it ties right into this because that's what was going on at that time. There was a lot of blasphemous speaking against God. And I suggest you study it on your own time, but you can put it in the context of this passage that, and you put it in Revelation 17 and you see the great whore, the harlot, the false religion is blasphemous. What is blasphemous? It's going against the Lord God. That's blasphemy. And this blasphemous religion is wicked. <clears throat> And there was given unto him in verse number five, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell 
in heaven. Look, this beast system doesn't want to be your buddy. This beast system, this beast is not there to save you. See, and I think that's why the false prophet ends up uh, just fulfilling the will of Satan all the time, because they want to get you away from God at all costs. Just like Balaam, he tried to trick Israel into sinning. Just like Cain, who brought his own works. And just like Korah, who said everybody's holy. Everybody should be the pastor. Everybody should be the head. Nobody should be the tail. Nobody should be the foot. Nobody should be the finger. Everybody, the whole congregation's holy. Everybody should preach. Everybody should teach. And that's not the case. God sets people apart to do these jobs. Why? Because everything has to be done decently and in order because if everybody's preaching we all know and if everybody's leading we all know that no two people agree on the same thing that's why there has to be one person in charge one that's the pastor and then it goes from him on down but let me tell you something you say well how can you trust the pastor well if he's got his faith and following in jesus christ hebrews chapter 13 5 the bible says in his conversation and his faith follow follow. You follow that if he's following Jesus. If not, if he's not following Jesus, you don't fight him, you leave. You back up and you leave. You don't get into a fight. You don't try to tear up the work of the ministry. Why? Because no two people agree on the same thing. And that's okay. It's not a problem to disagree on some things. It's perfectly okay. But there are a few things, there are a few things that you have to agree on. And see, if your pastor's preaching salvation, grace through faith, and your pastor's in the King James Bible, I believe it's the inspired word of God. Uh, you don't have to copyright it to write it on Bible tracks. All the other versions, you have to put the copyright and all these different things. Um, I, I believe if your pastor is doing what God wants him to do, you better back him and you better follow him. If you can't, then number one, you better do some soul searching. Number two, if you still can't after that, you're best to go follow someone you can. Because if you start throwing up trouble, there's going to be more trouble for you. You ought to read Hebrews chapter 13, because later on, I think it's uh, uh, verse I don't know, between 16 and 18, it says, obey them that have the rule over you. Okay? Why? That you may do it with joy. Or he, he's going to give an account for you that he may do it with joy and not grief because that's unprofitable for you. But see, this false shepherd, this false God, he doesn't want to help you out. You can't follow his conversation. You can't follow his faith. Why? Because it's in himself and he's wicked. <clears throat> Skip on down to uh, verse number 11, uh, verse number 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, out of the earth. Now, see, there's a difference of a beast coming up out of the sea. Why? <clears throat> Because the beast coming out of the sea has come from a vast, a vast land. He's come out of many waters. He's come out of many nations. He's come out of many tongues. Why? Because he has seven heads. But see, this is the final beast, and he's a false prophet, so he just comes up out of the earth. This one last beast just pops up out of the earth. Why? Because unfortunately, and I guess fortunately for humanity, this beast religion, even though they had multiple false religions tied to some of the greatest empires on earth, the first five, this one's going to be the icing on the cake of false religions. And I believe that's why he comes right up out of the earth. He comes right up in front of John because this guy, the False, uh, the Antichrist came right up out of the coffin, right up <clears throat> out of the ground, right up back to life, right in front of everybody. And so this may be a new religion, a new religion with the Antichrist on top. And this false prophet, what's he going to do? Let's read it. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. That's it. He's coming up. This is the mystery of the whore. She's coming up. 
the whore is actually coming up and placing authority on this final ruler. Why? Whose deadly wound was healed. He's come back from the dead. And it's a counterfeit Christianity. It's a counterfeit Christ. And it's going to deceive billions. Billions. And not to mention this deception, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, and for this cause, God shall send a strong delusion. Strong delusion coming from God as well. He's going to allow people, you know, <clears throat> if you're deceived, the Bible says that's an actual curse to be deceived. Just read Deuteronomy 28, 28. If you're deceived tonight or today, it's actually a curse to be deceived. You know, it's a blessing to be able to say, you understand. You say, wait, where do you get that? Well, isn't that what Jesus teaches? Teach? Blessed are your eyes, they're open. Blessed are your ears, for you hear. For I say there are many that desire to see my day and have not seen it. It's a blessing to understand God's word. It's a blessing to be able to interpret the Bible. It's a blessing to hear it when it's taught in context. And you're able to apply it. Look, don't be frustrated if it's something that you don't understand right away. Just keep at it. Just keep at it. Why? Because as you grow as a Christian, God will be able to show you a little more and a little more and a little more. And that's the point here. You're being able to be shown a little more about what the future actually holds. Now let's skip on for the sake of time. And he doth great wonders. So he's going to do miracles so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. And I think that's important because he's doing it in his sight, which means he's doing it in front of him, which means he's glorifying this beast. He's saying, you better watch this beast. I'm pulling fire down from heaven so you can worship him. I'm getting my power from the beast. Why? Because the beast is the dragon, the devil himself. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know, that's mentioned so many times, him being killed, that other than reading a false version of God's word, you would never gather that he doesn't die. Not from your King James Bible. He dies, but he comes back. Why? Because it isn't him anymore. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, next week I'll, or even Wednesday night, I'll get into a few of these things a little more in depth because the one thing about this seven-headed beast, he's the worst nightmare of all the worst world empires. And that's what the Bible clearly teaches. Not that the lion is England not that the leopard is Germany, not that the bear is Russia. Oh, during those times in the world, during the Cold War, many of those things were believable. But let me tell you something. We're going to use the Bible to show you exactly what those things mean. Because, see, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not the camouflage of Jesus Christ. So we don't take the book of Daniel to interpret the book of Revelation. We take the book of Revelation to interpret the book of Daniel. And that's the key. See, these 10 horns or these 10 kings, which have temporary power, they're not a 10 kingdom coalition uh, group in Europe. This isn't Austria, Pol come on. I believe because the beast sits on many waters, he has to control many nations. And it's going to be hard because he's not Jesus Christ. He's not the king of kings nor the Lord of lords. He's a counterfeit. He's an antichrist. He's another in the place of. He's not Jesus Christ. See, Jesus just had to speak it and it took place. See, when the centurion's daughter was dying, Jesus just had to say, turn around, go home. She'd better. In that same hour, she was healed. See, that's Jesus, but this guy, he's got to have a little bit of help because he's really not powerful. Although the world would want you to think he is, and they that worship him will think he is. 
But he's really, you know, the devil's a pipsqueak and a weakling. That's what Dr. Al Lacey used to preach from the pulpit for 20 some years. He's a weakling, that pipsqueak, the devil. And that's how you need to view Satan. If you view him like he's this all powerful, whatever, then maybe he will be to you and he may keep you down in sin. But he's a pipsqueak and Jesus can whip the socks off the devil at any time. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Keep that in your mind. Now, there's a lot in these two chapters that I've read, 17 and 13. I'm going to continue on. I believe I've got a little, little bit of time left. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And this is really important because the King James Bible says in your hand, in your forehead. And that's crucial. And I'll tell you why. Because as we see technology unfolding today, we can see that a computer chip being implanted in you is actually feasible. Elon Musk is getting ready to shoot up umpteenth number of satellites to deliver the internet to the world. 5G is getting ready to be unloaded on all humanity that they will be able to make your life convenient. See, whenever anybody wants to try to make your life convenient for you, they're actually going to make it to where you're a slave, right? Because what they did to the women in the 1950s was this. And appliances are a great thing. I'd rather wash them in a dishwasher than wash them by hand. But they also invented the television at the exact same time. Why? So they could invent wicked soap operas. So that women could sit there and watch the soap operas while the work was being done for them. And I think that that was part of the demise because women actually have a very vital role in the development of our nation if not the most important part. See, women are the hand that rocks the cradle, and the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Godly women teaching their children to be godly is what makes America godly. See, and now, and I could, I could just go off on this, and I, I probably, well, heck, all right. Um, soap operas are wicked. Okay, now they got a bunch of homosexuals running around with soap operas. And I'll tell you right now, Christian man and woman, you better quit watching them. Because they've got scenes and, oh, how do you know, Brother Aaron? Well, I hear because I definitely ain't watching the filth. You know what King David said? I place no wicked thing before my eyes. I don't even want to, I don't even want to see a picture of a transvestite. I don't want to see any of it. I don't want to see any wickedness. I want to try to stay away from it as best I can. Hey, Christian, if you're sitting there watching, well, hey, it used to be a good show. Hey, it was never a good show. Never. All they are is filled with adultery and murder and envy and debate, deceit, wickedness. And it crept in. And it carried away all these women laden with sins. Why? Because then they started to be not complacent with what their husbands were doing for them, how they go out and work for them and protect them and love and nurture them. Hey, and it's not all the women's fault. A lot of men went out and they were wicked as hell too. The whole problem is, is they needed to be at home reading their Bible together, studying God's word, being in the house of God when the doors were open, being at the house of God when the events were going on, serving the Lord on Saturday. Saturday going out knocking doors. Hey, you want to know why America's falling apart? Because it left its core values of doing those things. You want to save a nation? You want to move a mountain? You want to cast it into a sea? Get out there and knock on somebody's door. Show them God's love. Don't just tell them you love them. Show them from your Bible. It's the only way we're going to beat this thing. And technically, it's going to happen at some point, whether we want it to or not. And I'll tell you why. We can push it back, but this spirit is coming no matter what. But I'm going to push it back in my generation the best that I can. I'm going to push back because I'm going to go down fighting. I'm not going to go down with my dug, faint arms crossed, and I'm, I don't know, it's too hard to work. Man, what is wrong with America? Anyway, this mark is going to be able to people say, well, I, I mean, how, how are they going to be able to track people? Hey, who's heard of contract or contact tracing now? Now they've got all these programs. They're watching your phones to see if you came any came in contact with anybody with the hokey dokey virus or the hocus pocus virus. I mean, you just make it up. 
Just make up whatever you want. Call it the flu. Call it whatever. Call it Corona. Hey, you know what? Hey, we've been suffering from coronavirus for years because a lot of people are drinking that beer, getting behind their automobile, and they're killing more people than this. I'm sick. I <clears throat> anyway. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. See, he's going to he's going to make you contact trace at some point. There's going to be a system in place and we're watching this system be put in place today. You know, years ago, I would have said, well, you know, it's not in place. And I believe we've got a little more time because it's still not in place. But I guarantee you right now, because the devil has a short time, he's doing everything he can to put it in place because he knows when he gets that 70th week landmark, he in that seven years of tribulation, he knows that he has but a shorter time. He knows he's running out of time. He's going down to the abyss. He don't want to go there. A thousand years to him in the abyss is going to be a nightmare, but it's going to be no nightmare compared to the eternity in the lake of fire for that guy. Oh, he's the devil. He's not a guy. Hey, you know what the Bible says? As we stand there, we say, is this the man that caused the earth to tremble? Is this the man? We, you know why? Because we're going to be in our glorified bodies standing with Jesus Christ going, pip squeak the devil. That guy? I didn't even get to the part I wanted to get to. But I'm just going to go ahead and gloss over this because... And Daniel chapter 7 is where we'll probably go Wednesday night. But I'm going to just briefly, if I have a few minutes, do I have enough time, Pastor? Do I have a couple minutes? A couple minutes? All right. I got a couple minutes. Um, the first world empire was the Egyptian empire. And because this beast sits on many waters, because he has all the attributes of the devil, and because he has all this wickedness and false religion, Egypt was steeped in wickedness. And that wickedness has transcended the time. We even see a lot of that wickedness today. It's everywhere. Why do we have Egyptian stuff all over the place? I'll tell you why. It's because spirit of Babylon didn't leave Egypt and just disappear. It left Egypt and encompassed the world. And the one major thing that you notice when you go into Genesis chapter 41, right around the time that Joseph gets sold into slavery by his brothers, shortly after that, a famine takes place. And a famine is a shortage of food. It's not an ability to get a lot of food. And I'll tell you right now, the news is preaching that we're going to have a 20 to 40% drop in food this year because people can't go to work or because people were so scared they didn't go to work or because they just want to cause this food shortage. And I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be anything like this food shortage when the black horse starts to ride. But I'll tell you right now, this food shortage is right around the corner. Why? Because one of the seven heads, the Egyptian head, I believe dealt a lot with famine and false religion. That's why he could control the world, Pharaoh. He had everybody afraid not to worship his gods. And he controlled the world through false religion. Matter of fact, you had to go to him to buy food. And that's exactly what the Bible is saying in Revelation chapter 13. If you don't have the mark and you come to the Pharaoh Antichrist, you're not going to be able to get anything. Nothing. You better get saved now. Now, now is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart as in the day of the provocation where you attempted to be 40 years and believed not. Why? Because there's a coming strong delusion from God as well. Why, what's, what's the verse say in 2 Thessalonians before that verse? Because that they all might be damned, that love not the truth, that they might be saved. And you better be really careful. You better quit flirting with sin. You better quit messing around. You better quit and get right with God. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> you couldn't buy or sell without Pharaoh's permission. You're not going to be able to buy or sell in this world empire without Pharaoh's decision again. Why? Because he's one of the seven heads. He's your first head. And he'll use famine and whatever means possible to corrupt the world currency. The second one is Assyria. Assyria, that's another head. What made Assyria so wicked? They sacrificed their children to Baal. They would be brutal. There was no forgiveness. There was only slaughter. 
That's why in the book of Nahum, it says, woe unto you, bloody city. That's why when Jonah came, they repented. And then later on, they went back to their wickedness of murder and violence. Violence comes from the word to violate. They would violate. They would slaughter. The Assyrians had a way of killing a man in which they would skin him alive, that he would stay alive longer and not die right away. And if you were to read the book of Revelation and you were to look at chapter 13 and chapter six, and you were to look at Daniel where it says he wears out the saints of the most high, those that are here in the time of the tribulation, they will be tortured to death. They will be executed. Many will lose their head. They will be beat to death. That's why he's one of the seven heads, head number two. Head number two, the Assyrian head, the violent head, the one that comes in and says, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to enjoy doing it. I'm going to torture you and they're going to laugh as they do it. And you say, wait, that's wicked. That's cruel. Yeah, well, uh, the Bible gives an account of the Roman guards doing the exact same thing. They mocked, they spit, they smoked, they pulled, they knocked a thorn, a, cr uh, a crown of thorns upon his head. They, they literally enjoyed beating Jesus to a bloody pulp. I'm not trying to scare you, but I am. Number one, I'm trying to scare you straight. Scare you straight. You can apply that any way you want. Every way being scared straight is a good way. The Bible says on some having compassion, I believe we've crossed that line. It says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Jude 24 and 25. Let me tell you something right now. You need to get right with God. Because I'll tell you right now, you're getting right with God, he, Christian, because I'm sure there's not a lot of unsaved listening to this. Christian, you get right with God, and I'll tell you why. Your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids depend on it. And I'll tell you right now, from the looks of things in the world today and everything that's going on, there's a lot of people who were really sound in the faith. They got carried away with all kinds of strange doctrines and things, and their kids and grandkids have suffered. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for everything you've given me. I don't take it for granted, not one bit. Every breath you've given me, I'm thankful. Lord, I love you with all my heart. And Lord, I know that if we started to just love you the way we should, a sacrificial love where we put you first and not ourselves, oh, we battle the flesh. Oh, I fall so many times. I can get angry. Lord, anger is the thing I, I deal with sometimes. I get so frustrated and I just try to have the peace that passes all understanding. I try to lay that at the foot of the cross because you are a savior. You are the Christ. You're not a fake Christ. You're not an antichrist. You're the one Christ. You're the one who went to the cross for me, but not just for me, for the whole world. Lord, strengthen us as a people. Strengthen the Christians at home today, Lord. Strengthen. They don't need to have a spirit of fear. They don't need the spirit, the spirit of antichrist, this world religion, this world wicked. This, it's ridiculous. Just get on our Bibles. Help us, Lord, please. In Jesus' name, amen.